And joining me now is ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl. He's the author of the new book, Tired of Winning, Donald Trump and the End of the Grand Old Party. So let me start with, I read this book. It did not take me long. It's a really amazing in-depth read, and I highly recommend it. But there's an argument out there that Trump has always been this way. You hear Republicans say this, you hear some of his advisors say this, that the behavior we see today is the Donald Trump we should have all always known. Reading this book, it sounds like you disagree with that notion. Uh, I do. I mean, look, there are elements that he, he's always been like. He's always been obsessed with himself. He's always been willing uh, to lie, to prop himself up. Uh, but Donald Trump of 2023 is not the same guy that came into the White House uh, in, in 2017. Uh, he is more divorced from reality. He is more... Uh, undeterred to, to do whatever is on his mind. I think one of the biggest factors here um, is that all the guardrails are gone. When he came into the White House, there were people that came with him mm. who felt it was their duty to try to keep him, protect him and protect the country from his most destructive impulses, which were always clearly there. Those people are gone. Uh, the people that you know, tried to, to, to steer him in the White House counsel's office, like Don McGahn or Pat Cipollone are gone. Uh, people like General Mattis, John Kelly, they're gone. Anybody who tried to do anything to hold him back is now gone. It is Trump and his most sycophantic supporters that are with him now. You have a rather stunning detail you talk about in the book. It's about an order Trump to this point that you just made, signed to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan, which is a massively consequential decision. Yeah. I don't have to tell anyone. And yet the document was effectively forged by Trump's body man uh, with no input from military or national security advisors. You write, quote, the president of the United States couldn't get the people he appointed to care carry out his policies because he couldn't be bothered to learn how to implement them. I mean, you referenced having kind of a protective group of people who are trying to prevent him from his behavior in a first term. What do you think a second term would look like? Well, at the end, this was Johnny McEntee, his uh, personnel uh, director, who was originally the guy that carried his bag, yes. the body guy. He was promoted, uh, to be yes, fair. Yes, he was promoted, but he kept the body guy job. So yeah. he had his uh, desk right outside the Oval Office and was always with Trump, but was also responsible for the largest uh, and most important HR department in the federal government, uh, hiring and firing of 4,000 political appointees throughout the executive branch. And McEntee, uh, after uh, Trump lost the election, uh, set out to remake the Defense Department. It was him uh, who uh, went through and helped Trump decapitate Mark Esper and the top leadership and install people that would do exactly what Trump wanted. And he actually ends up writing this order, which we've known about in the past. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is, is that he was literally trying to figure out how to do it by going on Googling. Googling. And then, and then, and then uh, D Doug McGregor, this guy that they put over as, as, uh, as the advisor for the new defense secretary says, just go to the file cabinet and get out an old executive order and look at the format and copy the format. Um, and he writes, it's not just to withdraw from Afghanistan, by the way, it's also to withdraw U.S. troops from Germany, yeah. to withdraw uh, U.S. troops uh, from the Middle East. I mean, it's, it's a massively consequential order. Eventually it was brought down, but it caused chaos over the, over the course of, of, of several days at the Pentagon. It reminded me just of what we've seen of this forum shopping to find staffers and lawyers, frankly, who agree with what Trump wants to do. And there was some element that wasn't that way in the first term, but feels like it could be in the second. I mean, part of this, we, we recently heard Trump, I mean, just over the last couple of days, uh, indict his political opponents. I say he's threatened he was going to indict his political opponents. He said he was rooting, he wanted to root out the vermin of the left. That's literally the term he used. Um, he has extreme positions on a range of issues, of course. But what, is, what do you make of these kind of increasing threats? It feels a little like the authoritarian uh, wiles of him are increasing, but what do you make of it? It's, it's, a, it's a central theme of my book, which is, and this is also something that is different. Uh, there is a coherent idea now behind Trump's re-election campaign. I don't know if there was always a coherent idea besides I'm the best, I'm the greatest, I'm mm -hmm. going to build the wall, all that stuff. Now it is retribution. As I uh, point out, uh, Steve Bannon, who has become, a, a, once again, an incredibly important advisor to Donald Trump, uh, talks about the come retribution speech, which launched his, which basically relaunched his 
presidential campaign at the time of that first rally in Waco, Texas, mm -hmm. of all places. He goes to Waco, Texas, where the Branch Davidians had their showdown uh, with, uh, with, with, with federal law enforcement back in, in 1993. The, the, basically, the inspiration for the armed right-wing militia movement, that's where he goes to launch his campaign. And it is about retribution. It's about seeking out his enemies. And that quote that you just cited about vermin, we're going mm -hmm. gonna, to we're gonna get the vermin, I mean, that is Nazi imagery. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is a Nazi, but those are the, that is the, the imagery language of, used of, by, by yes. Adolf Hitler. And there's a story in this book that I learned from, this is from a very senior member of Congress, close ally of Donald Trump told me about this, uh, that on at least two occasions, Trump told him about a story about Angela Merkel, the uh, then chancellor of Germany. You know, she told me that, uh, she, that, that, she only heard only one person has ever gotten crowds as big as me. That only one person could attract the crowds. And this is the chancellor of Germany mm -hmm. saying, Trump, that there's only one other. And, you know, Trump never says who it is. But, I mean, it's, and he's bragging about this. Mm -hmm. It's the admiration for these figures, current and in history, who yeah. are abhorrent to most people. One of the things that was so striking to me about the book is we've spent, we spent, we all spend so much time talking about the events of January 6th, yeah. right? The events leading up to January 6th, hugely important, consequential, horrible time in history. But you talk a lot in this book about what happened after that, including the fact that Trump, a full six months after Biden's inauguration, seemed to think that he could be reinstated. And we have a little audio uh, from your interview we're going to play, and then I want to talk to you about it. By the way, when you had a release recently, you said 2024 or before. What, what, what do you mean by that? You, you don't really think there's a way you would get reinstated before the next election. I'm not going to explain it to you, Jonathan, because you, uh, you wouldn't either understand it or write it. I mean, that, 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 this is incredible, and this is one of the things. For all the, all the things that you saw over the course of the Trump presidency, this one really stood out to me for the post-presidency. Mm -hmm. Mike Lindell, the MyPillow election denying, you know, guy, he, he was out saying that Trump was going to be reinstated, and he had an oddly specific date. He said August 13th This was right before that, shortly before and this it. was right before that. I figured this was like a QAnon, wacky thing that was out there. I, but, but I saw this press release that he had put out, and it wasn't a press release about it. It was about something else, and then it was actually criticizing NBC. Mm -hmm. uh, but the last lines of it were 2024 or before, and that's why I asked if he... And, and you can see, he's like, I'm not going to explain it to you. So he's not denying it. But what I found is he was actively pursuing this. He was talking about it with everybody who would listen privately, um, and he seemed to truly believe that there was going to be a series of steps that would happen in these states that he lost and that Donald Trump was going to be able to go back into the White House. Joe Biden was going to be evicted. And that there's there's a story. I mean, it's not, by the way, just six months, because what I learned is that, that interview was about six months. Yes, later. yes. But it kept on going on yes. into into last year, into 2022. He actually went to Mo Brooks, who he had endorsed running for Senate. Uh, in Alabama. Who's quite conservative, I think people Mo, should Mo be. Brooks, I mean, let, let's put it this way. He wore body armor right. to, the, to the speech outside the White House on January 6th. He was the first guy to lead the objections in Congress to Biden's certification. So anyway, so Mo Brooks, he, he called Mo Brooks up and, um, again, on an unannounced call, and Mo Brooks told me he picked it up, and, and he made a series of four demands of him. Uh, and the demands were all related to this reinstatement thing. He wanted Brooks to go out and call on Biden to be removed from the White House, call for a rerunning of the election, and, uh, and for Trump to be reinstated as president. And Mo Brooks, again, in a pretty extreme Trump diehard, yeah. said, no, that's unconstitutional. I can't do it. And Trump then a few days later withdrew his endorsement. But this is what was going on. He really thought that something was going to happen, the cyber ninjas audit in Arizona and everything else, that it was all going to come to this big culminating moment and he was going to go back into the White House. You talk to a lot of people and you've kept in touch with, I think, a lot of people who worked for him or yeah. worked around him. And another really fascinating detail in your book is you mentioned an anonymous former high level official in the Trump White House, somebody close to him, you yep. describe it as, who shared his reflections with you after Trump was indicted. And he said, quote, I'm going to read this because it's kind of 
jarring. Uh, he lacks a, any shred of human decency, humility, or caring. He is morally bankrupt, breathtakingly dishonest, lethally incompetent, and stunningly ignorant of virtually anything related to government, history, geography, human events, or world affairs. He is a traitor and a malignancy in our nation and represents a clear and present danger to our democracy and the rule of law. I mean, that is quite a statement for somebody who has yeah. spent time close to and around the former president. And that was a something he wrote down relatively recently. Yes, th this, and, and this is somebody who served more than a year at a very high level inside the West Wing, uh, very close to Donald Trump. Not somebody that went out publicly and repeated the lies about the election. He's not one of those people, but he's also not somebody who has publicly come out to, to condemn Trump either. So it's not one of what they would call the usual suspects. This is somebody who served him, served him loyally uh, for more than a year. And it gets to a fundamental truth about Donald Trump, and that is the most piercing and searing criticism of him. The people that are sounding the alarm loudest about what a second Trump term would mean are those who were closest to him. Some of them have gone public. Uh, people like John Kelly uh, have, have gone public to, to, to make this point. A lot of them have not. Uh, this is a very and you might ask, well, why don't they come out? Why doesn't this person come out and 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 sound I would ask publicly? That. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good question. Now that you asked, Jen. Um, <laughs> but you know what? What he told me is uh, that he, frankly, he fears the retribution, not from just, Trump, from Trump, not and Trump and Trump's people, not just to him, uh, but to his family. Um, and he, this person has gone on, is not directly active in politics right now. Uh, I think is quite chastened from this experience. Um, and you saw those words, uh, really warning about not just what Trump was like, but what it would be like if he came back. Jonathan Carl, this book, Tired of Winning, is a huge wake-up call, has many, many details included in it. I really enjoyed reading it. It's out tomorrow and available wherever you get your books. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. Thank you, Jen.